Well, how an infantryman got to be called in to talk about artillery is through, uh, I'm under here on false pretenses and a misunderstanding. And my good friend Paul Stevens is, uh, is enjoying a great holiday because I wanted to pass the buck to him, but he said, no, no fear, no, no, no way in the world. Actually, my talk is uh, on fire support at the Anzac Landing. Uh, and in this, I hope to bring out uh, a number of the problems the gunners had and, uh, and look at uh, a command and control as we go through. Because what we see in the First World War is a great evolution in the development of command and control uh, and the use of artillery. Um, to my mind, the Great War is a war in which we see modern infantry tactics to being developed and modern artillery tactics being, uh, being developed as well. So what are we talking about when we're talking about artillery in the First World War? Well, essentially in that uh, red block is what the divisional artillery consisted of in those days. It had uh, three field uh, brigades, uh, each of uh, three batteries. It had a howitzer artillery brigade, again of three batteries, and a, and a four-gun, 60-pounder uh, battery of guns. So the field brigade, as I talk to you today is essentially what we call an artillery regiment today. Now, pre-1914 pre uh, artillery doctrine is pretty sparse. One of the reasons why I wanted to pass this uh, presentation on to somebody else. The manuals, uh, as one commentator has described them, are more suggestive than prescriptive. Uh, and the British are coming out of a period of colonial warfare. They're coming out of a period where the infantry are up there uh, <coughs> fighting the fight, the artillery come in and support them. Uh, they've had a bit of a shock in the Boer War. And in the period from 1901 through to 1914, there's a great deal of debate going on in, uh, in how artillery should be used. Um, new guns are being introduced. Uh, and they're looking at the way the Germans are doing it, looking at the way the French are doing it, finding contradictions, and they're not, too, they're not too sure how they're actually going to use artillery. But the doctrine uh, at the time talks about a war of movement. They're seeing, um, they're seeing warfare much the same as uh, in the 19th century, infantry moving, artillery in support. The main function of the field artillery was neutralisation. The round used in the 18-pounder field gun was a shrapnel round. And in fact, the first uh, Anzac artillery did not get their, the Anzac artillery on Gallipoli did not get their first HE rounds until June 1915. So it's basically to suppress the infantry. And it's an accessory to infantry tactics. The aim of the battle in those days was seen to suppress the enemy with fire, overcome his fire, and in this the artillery would come in and support the infantry fire by laying down the shrapnel on the enemy infantry um, or trying to suppress his guns. <clears throat> now, in the planning of artillery, um, the artillery didn't get a look in, basically. The infantry made the infantry plan and the artillery slotted into it and supported the infantry, whatever their tactics were. Now, there was a great debate going on at the time as to whether the guns would be used in the direct fire role or in the indirect fire role. Many of the artillery pundits were still arguing that the guns had to be up with the infantry, either in the infantry line or just behind it, providing direct fire support. And part of the problem was, uh, the reason why they said was it added uh, morale to the infantry, it stiffened their morale to have the guns firing beside them. And secondly, there were problems with communications, and I'll go into that a little later. So pre-1914 artillery command and control, the divisional CRA had a very small staff. I think he had a BM, a staff captain and a reconnaissance officer. And nor did he have sufficient communication. So essentially, he was incapable of concentrating divisional fire and virtually incapable of coordinating the fire between divisions. So we see artillery pre-1914 and the divisional artillery is very much the infantry support weapon, up there, with the, uh, up there with the infantry. But there was no firm view on how the artillery brigades would be deployed. And some divisional commanders bypassed the, uh, the CRA and deployed an artillery brigade directly to an infantry brigade and, 
and the infantry brigade commander would tell the artillery brigade commander where, where he wanted those guns and how those guns would be used. And essentially, it was about putting the guns up close behind the infantry to give them that fire support. Uh, some divisional commanders decided that they would use the artillery like, a, like an infantry brigade, and he would use the guns through the CRA, and the CRA would deploy the guns uh, in support of the uh, divisional commander's plan. Other divisional commanders decided they would keep their guns as a reserve. So there was a sort of a, you know, guns in reserve were fire in reserve. Uh, so there was no real firm doctrine on how the guns would be used uh, prior, to, uh, prior to 1914. And as I said, one of the problems was communications. And essentially all they had in those days to control fire between the forward observer and the gun line, if the gun line was in indirect fire, was semaphore, heliograph or telephone cable. Sometimes a, uh, well, the semaphore is just using flags, the heliograph, as you know, is the uh, mirror image, and uh, telephone cable was run out to the FO. So let's have a look at the Anzac Divisional Artillery at the landing. Uh, First Australian Division only had three field artillery brigades. It did not have the howitzers or heavy guns. And the New Zealand and Australian yeah. Division only had two brigade, uh, one brigade, and it also had a howitzer battery. So they had a total of 40 field guns and four howitzers, and these are the, these are the weapons of the day that they used. Also in core troops for ANZAC was the 7th Indian Mountain Artillery Brigade, and it consisted of two batteries using the 10-pounder breech-loading uh, mountain gun. Now, it's a small gun, as you can see in the photograph there. Uh, it's, it's also called the screw gun, the barrel screws in half, and it's carried by pack horse or pack mule uh, and is uh, designed as a close support weapon to infantry. So what was the intent of ANZAC? I'd have to say that the popular view of the landing at Anzac is so distorted that it bears little or no resemblance to what actually occurred. The aim of the uh, uh, Anzac was to, uh, first of all, was the 1st Australian Division's job was to secure the Seri Bear Range, which is that high hill uh, to the top. They'd do that in two phases. Firstly, landing immediately south of Anzac Cove, actually the left flank abutting onto the cove, the 3rd Brigade would uh, secure a covering position uh, shown by that dotted line running down 3rd Ridge. That covering position was designed to give the main body enough room to get, a, get ashore without being interfered by the enemy and also to give them room for manoeuvre. Echelon slightly north of the 3rd Brigade and to include Anzac Cove, the 2nd Brigade would pass up the main range and seize the heights, as you can see by the numbers 8, 7, and five. So fire support. What was the fire support available to ANZAC at the landing? Well, the first was naval gunfire, and I won't go into it in great detail because we have someone who's going to talk about that. But essentially, there were three main uh, ways of controlling it, or what the orders say. There was air observation. HMS Ark Royal put up an aeroplane. Uh, it would fly over and through various means uh, uh, provide observation of artillery. Uh, HMS Manica put up a uh, balloon off, uh, off Anzac Cove so they could observe inland from the balloon. The infantry were to carry flags, red and yellow flags, and these were to be planted in the ground where they, were, uh, where they got forward to so the flags would denote how far forward the infantry were. And also they had a dedicated uh, two dedicated forward observation officers from the Divisional Artillery. And uh, that was the arrangements for <coughs> providing it. Uh, two flank radio stations would be positioned on the beach, what they called the right and left flank radio stations. Um, they would uh, provide a link back to the battleship. Forward of those radio stations, telephone cable would be run forward with the FO. And he would make his fire adjustments back to the radio, the radio would send it back to the battleship, the battleship would just decide who, who would provide the fire. In addition to that, the uh, Indian Mountain Brigade was allotted to the 3rd Infantry Brigade, which was the covering force, so the covering force would go ashore immediately behind them, the Indian Mountain Brigade would go ashore and act under the brigade commander, providing close support uh, to the infantry. 
The field guns, pretty sparse. I mean, one of the things when you look at the artillery at the landing, and even on Gallipoli, the doctrine and the instructions and that are pretty damn sparse. And all I could find was that the field guns would disembark and they would be allocated, uh, and they would wait allocation once as the battle developed. So there's the situation at 0600. Uh, we actually landed 4,000 men against 80 Turkish riflemen. There were no machine guns on the beach. Uh, they quickly scaled the heights. The second platoon of the 2nd Battalion, 27th Regiment, took off. I mean, 80 against 4,000 is, uh, is not great odds. And so by 6.30, the 3rd Brigade had punched a gaping hole in the Turkish defence and advanced forward as far as 2nd Ridge. But there were two decisions made by the covering force commander which determined the fate of the battle. And these were made virtually on the beach and certainly on Pluggy's Plateau. First, first <coughs> orders he gave was that the 3rd Brigade would halt short of its objective. And you can see it there halted on an area called 2nd Ridge or the 400 Plateau of which Lone Pine is part of it. Problem with uh, Second Ridge is everything to the north and down Third Ridge as far as that top red dotted arrow is concerned at Scrubby Knoll dominated Second Ridge. You actually look down upon it and Charles Bean described the Lone Pine and the 400 area around the Second Ridge as like a Greek amphitheatre with the Australians standing on the stage and the Turks essentially on the high ground overlooking it. The second decision he made, uh, and this was, sorry, this was to have a great effect on the battle. Not a, the distance between Anzac Cove and Second Ridge is about 800 to 900 metres. So it's a very narrow area. It's a very restricted covering force area and had two, two effects, uh, three effects on the infantry. First of all, as I've described, they were overlooked by the Turks. Secondly, they had no room for manoeuvre. And thirdly, for the artillery, it severely restricted the gun positions that could be, uh, could be made available. And that was, have to, that, they, that was have to have a great effect. The second decision he made is as soon as the 2nd Brigade came ashore, instead of it being sent up to the heights, which was its task, he diverted it to the right. And he sent it down south of the 400 plateau into even lower ground. So the bulk of the 1st and 3rd Brigades held the lower end of 2nd Ridge, and we basically had about three or four companies holding the high ground. So by about 9.30, the Turkish reinforcements had marched their eight kilometres from Maidos, that's the uh, two battalions of the 27th Regiment, uh, and the 57th Regiment was moving up as well. It arrived uh, just after 10 o'clock. So basically, we were sitting there for about you know, two or three hours waiting for Turkish reinforcements to arrive. So what were the results of the fire support that were provided? Well, the arrangements might have been put in place for the naval gunfire to be provided, but the naval observers had great difficulty locating the infantry. They expected them to be forward on the covering force position, but in fact they were behind. There were some. Uh, about three parties got onto Third Ridge before the Turks arrived, but they were driven off at about 11 o'clock. <coughs> Secondly, the radios proved to be unreliable, um, according to the information that I've uh, got, is that, and there was virtually no naval gunfire support on the 25th of April. Certainly, I can find no indication of uh, naval gunfire being uh, fired that day, except for HMS Bacanti. Bacanti took on a duel with the Turkish battery at Gaba Tepe. It actually consisted of two 1885 field guns, one had a broken elevating lever, and so uh, Bacandy took on this one field gun and achieved virtually nothing, because the gun continued firing until about 1.30 in the morning, at uh, 1.30 in the afternoon. So the naval gun fire support proved to be pretty ineffective uh, in support of the infantry ashore. Um, the other um, group that came ashore with 26 Jacobs Battery out of the uh, Indian Mountain Brigade. It didn't get ashore until 10.30 in the morning. It moved up to that red, roughly where that red dot is behind the 400 plateau. But the Turkish guns, there's a mountain battery here of four gun, uh, mountain, two mountain batteries of four guns. Uh, they're overlooking uh, uh, Lone Pine. 
and within two and a half hours that battery is put out of action. Uh, the Turks uh, are firing direct fire directly onto it and it's knocked out of action or it's actually withdrawn out of action due to casualties. The field artillery. Well, the field artillery didn't get into action. Bridges refused to bring the field guns ashore. And the reasons given is that there were a lack of gun positions. He's also uh, uh, been quoted as saying he feared that the guns would be captured. And so some of the guns were brought ashore, but as soon as they got ashore, he sent them back to the transports. And one gun finally got ashore at 1600, and that's it being dragged up onto the 400 plateau. So field guns, there were no field, uh, uh, no field guns got into action on the day of the 25th. So the gun started, if you have a look at the way in which the guns were landed, all you can say is they came across, came ashore in a pretty ad hoc uh, situation. They're the only guns that landed on the 25th of April. And on the 26th, they sort of dribbled ashore in, in, uh, in that sort of fashion. In fact, five of the 12 field batteries could not be landed at Anzac because there certainly was not enough room to put them. And those five, five field batteries were taken down to Cape Helles, where there were many more gun positions, and they remained there for the rest of the campaign. So, why, what were the problems with the artillery? Well, first of all, they had great difficulty with finding gun positions. The first gun positions, as I said, were uh, just behind the 400 plateau. Uh, they started, uh, those guns were knocked out of action. They then started putting them on Pluggy's Plateau, which is the uh, red dot immediately above Anzac Cove. The howitzers were put on the beach north of Anzac Cove, below the Sphinx there. Uh, but other guns were pushed right up into the line. And in fact, there's uh, an action on the uh, evening of the 26th of April uh, of two guns uh, up in the wheat field there. That's the bottom, uh, bottom red dot. Uh, and they're right up in the infantry line. And the Turks attack across the wheat field. The gunners set their fuses to discharge as immediately as the shells leave the barrel. And they just sweep away. Uh, the Turkish uh, troops that are advancing across the wheat field. So those guns are firing directly in the line over open sites as they see the, uh, the, uh, the enemy attacking. So initially they're just pushing their guns up into what positions they can. They're not being put up in battery positions, they're being put up in single gun positions, two gun positions or three gun positions. But eventually uh, they work out that <coughs> they get guns up where they can get some height, so they're up there on Russell's top, which is, uh, you can see up there, and they're on Pluggy's Plateau. The rest of the guns really are in indirect fire positions, as close behind the infantry as they can get them. Now what they eventually do, and uh, here, here's a quote from the 1st Division Artillery War Diary on the 3rd of May. So this is, uh, you know, this is about a week after the landing. It says, better communications between batteries and infantry m most necessary to prevent delay caused by requests for fire coming through Ostdiv and NZ Nadiv and also direct to Divati. So what I'm reading from that is, is that the requests for artillery are coming up through the infantry line to, uh, to the divisional headquarters being passed to Divati and then going down the artillery chain, or they're coming up to, from brigade directly to Divati and then going down the Divati chain. He says there are too many sibs. I don't know what he means by that. Improvement promised by proposal to allot guns to sections of defence. They will not be allowed to fire in any other section without special permit. So what they're starting to develop is that rather than keep the guns as a central control, under central control, the guns are going to be allotted to a specific section on the defensive line. And they can only fire on that defensive line um, and they cannot fire in any other section of the, uh, the front without a special permit. And uh, a little later in the campaign, this is, comes out of an instruction written in September, but 
Uh, clearly it backs up what arrangements were in place a little bit earlier. But the tactical control of the whole of the Divisional Artillery remains under the Divisional Artillery Commander. Now they're mainly for tasks to fire in depth, uh, to fire on Turkish reserves, to fire on Turkish communication lines uh, or whatever. So for that tactical control for guns firing in depth is under the Divisional Artillery Commander. As I've said earlier, the field guns are allotted sections of the defence line and the infantry commander, the, the instruction says the infantry commander passes his request directly to the artillery brigade commander and in ordinary circumstances that request will be, will be made immediately without reference to Divati, although Divati is to be advised of what the request is. Support from guns in another section can only be made by, they can be made by either the artillery brigade commander of the section requesting the guns, going to the artillery brigade commander who's got the, uh, in, the uh, in the section they want the support from, and that, that uh, gunfire will then be provided, or he can go to Divadi, Divadi can coordinate which arty brigade is to fire. The howitzers and the mountain guns remain under Divadi control, and any requests for those guns have to go through Divadi before the fire mission can be supplied. And that's about as far as they've got. And that's about all the information uh, after trolling through the war diaries and uh, the artillery instructions that we've got. So we're starting to see this development of rather than just infantry, uh, the guns firing in support of the infantry and being allocated to a brigade, uh, they're slowly developing what is a pretty rudimentary form of command and control for artillery. It's pretty flexible. Some missions are provided by Divadi, other, other missions are directly between the artillery uh, brigade controlling the guns in a particular section and the infantry brigade. But the artillery had a lot of difficulties. And this uh, is a report found in one of the war diaries, uh, written in May, and it says, regretted that the artillery up to this time has not been able to give more assistance to the infantry owing to the following circumstances. And these are the difficulties the gunners had. The unsuitability of field guns in the hill, hilly country uh, operating and in the scarcity of gun positions. And what they're uh, talking about is uh, the flat, flat trajectory of the guns. They had difficulty in observing fire. They say that this is mostly done by forward observers in the infantry fire trenches themselves or in more exposed positions. And the fact that they're on the lower ground makes it very difficult for the artillery FO to actually observe fire much beyond uh, the enemy trenches. There is difficulty of communications between the forward observer and the gun line. Telephone is the primary means, but it is often interrupted and frequently broken. They have difficulty distinguishing between the enemy's trenches and our own trenches, and the reason for this is for most part of the line the trenches were between 10 and 100 yards apart and they're on pretty flat country. They also talk about the shortness of range and the flatness of trajectory makes it difficult to search gullies. And remember there's only that one battery of howitzers at this stage and later on more howitzers come in uh, to give them that uh, feel behind uh, where, where the Turkish reserves are and where their, their guns are. Uh, other than that, the field guns are largely used to uh, provide support to the infantry. And the, th the sixth thing that they talk about is that the enemy counter battery fire, enemy machine gun fire and enemy snipers are playing havoc with the gun positions. So that's about all we've got uh, about uh, fire support for the landing and the, the development of art artillery fire and, uh, command and control during the campaign. Thanks very much.